We're in the book of Hebrews, chapter 2. And really tonight, we'll begin at about verse 16. Uh, if I've got this to the arrow. Uh, the idea is Jesus came to help men, not to angels. Verse 16 said, For surely it is not with angels that he is concerned, but with the descendants of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brethren in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make expiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered and been tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. And so we look here to the passage here. I'm reading there on that occasion, reading from the Revised Standard Version. The New King James Version says, For he indeed does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. And all of that is still a little bit different from what the King James Version says. The King James reads, For verily he took not on himself the nature of angels. Uh, and they're looking at all the different translations and the things about it, it seems like the, uh, the New King James, the American Standard, Revised Standard, are, are more along the same line. The idea is that when Jesus came to this world, he came to this world in order to give aid, to give help, not to angels, but to men, to the descendants, he says here, of Abraham. Uh, since men are the brothers of Christ, he came to save them. Uh, he didn't come to save angels. And so we're looking at what Christ's concerned, his you know, relationship with us, uh, and not that with angels. Uh, Brother Neil Lightfoot expressed it this way. He said the author uh, is not simply saying that Jesus is concerned with men, but that he helps them and delivers them. The entire thought is that he laid hold of men in order to help them out of their distressed condition. When Jesus came to this world, he didn't come here just because of a concern for men, but it was the desire that he had to help men. Men were lost in sin. There was nothing we could do about it. And so he came to help us in that by being the, becoming the Savior of all mankind, giving his life for us that we might be redeemed. Now, the expression is made here says he came not to, to help the angels, but he's concerned with the descendants of Abraham. Now, generally, you might look at that and you might say, who, who are the descendants of Abraham? Who would he be talking about? Well, it could be that he's talking about the Jewish people. Uh, he's concerned about them. They're the ones who are the descendants of Abraham. But he didn't just come, as it were, to save the Israelites from their sin. He had a great interest in them. Uh, he was born as one of them, uh, as an Israelite. But there's more to it than that. Uh, I'd like for us to look at some passages given to us in the book of Galatians. And someone turn over to Galatians chapter 3. And we're going to be looking at three different verses in that chapter. Uh, first of all, I'd like to begin with verse 7. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 7. He's got that passage for us, please. All right, Billy, would you read it? Okay. The children of Abraham, he's talking about there, those who are of faith, those people have faith in God like Abraham had, they are the ones who are the true children of, of Abraham. So when the Hebrew writer talks about Christ coming in this world, you know, to help the descendants of Abraham, yes, it could be talking about the Jewish people, but it's much more than that. It extends not just to the Jews, but to anyone, Jew or Gentile, that has faith in God like Abraham had. Now look at verse 9. And Billy, since you're there, if you'll go ahead and read that too. Okay. Those that are of faith, those that have that faith in God like Abraham had, are blessed with Abraham. And so the coming of Christ in the world is going to be concerned not just with Abraham and his physical descendants, but those individuals that have the same faith that Abraham had. And then the last verse we'll look at is chapter 3 and verse 29. And really, I think this is, is the key to that. Someone else has got verse 29. Can we read right, Brother Merrill, please. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Okay. If you're a Christian, if you belong to Christ, then guess what? Paul says here, you are of Abraham's seed. Uh, the New King James said you're Abraham's offspring. And so the descendants of Abraham that we're talking about uh, would include everyone, Jew or Gentile, who has that faith in Christ, that faith in God like Abraham had. So we're really uh, the offspring of Abraham. 
and we're the ones that, that, that Christ has come into this world to help. Now, his desire is to help every man. He's, his desire is to be the Savior of all men. The sad thing is that not all men are going to accept Christ, are going to heed him and do what he says. But everyone that does that, uh, that has that faith in Christ, to, to act in obedience to his will, those are the individuals who are the true offspring of Abraham, and they're the ones that are really going to be blessed and helped by Christ. Uh, he goes on here in Hebrews chapter 2, in verse 17, uh, and I think I put that up here, yeah, verse 17, Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in those things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Now, this is the first time there's been some hinting at it. This is the first time that Christ is referred to as the high priest. And so he tells us here that in order to be the high priest, it became necessary that Christ had to become like us in all things. He had to be made like unto his brethren uh, in order that he might be a merciful, and he says, a faithful high priest. And so we stop to think about this. Uh, Hebrews 4 and verse 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So two chapters from here, he's going to flatly say that Jesus Christ is our high priest. Uh, he is the one that can sympathize with us. He understands about our weaknesses we have in life. So he had become like us in order that he could be that merciful and faithful high priest. So two things here. That are important for us to look at. Number one, in order he might become a merciful high priest. Now, when you think about this idea of being merciful, what, what comes to your mind? What kind of a high priest is a merciful high priest? Well, he's kind to us. You know, he sees, he understands the needs that we have, he understands our weaknesses. Uh, and yet also he has the ability to do what's necessary to help us. You know, sometimes we might feel kindness towards someone, but we may not be able to help them. But Christ has the full power to help men. Now, a priest uh, has what responsibility to the people? He, or he's to intercede for them. You know, uh, here's mankind that's committed sin, and under that old law, that Jewish priest had to make intercession for them for God, to God by doing what? Offering the sacrifices to God. And now here we have Jesus Christ, our high priest, a merciful high priest. He not only sees the needs we have, but he has the ability, the full power to do something about it. And he's going to offer himself as the sacrifice, the one and true sacrifice that can really take away the sins of men. And so he's a merciful high priest to that. Now, you think about this. Uh, being a merciful priest uh, has to do with the compassion that, that Christ has for us. Uh, you look at all the physical priests that the Israelites had through the years. Uh, there were some problems uh, with them being able to understand and, and, and to do something to, to help. Uh, if a person is guilty of sin, and every high priest that the Jews had, like all of us, were guilty of sin. Uh, when someone comes to you, if, if, if they're guilty of sin, and you come to them as a sinner looking help, what's the possibility of how they might react towards you? Number one, they might be too compassionate towards you. You know, because, they, hey, I'm, you know, that high priest could say, I've got the same problems you've got, I've committed the same type of sins you've committed. I'm in that same predicament you're in. And I know how you're feeling. And I know the situation you're in. And so because of that, he may tend to be too lenient and just may say to you, don't worry about it. You know, uh, I'll take care of that. Everything will be all right with you. But if a person is someone uh, who's never sinned, then what's the problem he might have with those who come to him with sin problems? He might not understand, and what? Yeah, he might not be kind or, or merciful towards you. You know, he may have a, a totally different attitude. Think about yourself, you know. Uh, 
any particular sin in your life that you, you, you can't understand why anybody would even be involved in. You know, uh, uh, you think to yourself, that's something I've never done. I've never had a desire to be involved in that type of sin. And yet, there are people all around that do it. And we might have the attitude, I don't understand that. Why would you be so dumb as to commit a sin like that? And because that they might not be merciful toward you, they might be, you know, angry toward you if they have that. But now we've got a high priest today in Jesus. Uh, he's unlike us, and he's never committed a sin. And yet, he understands our sins because he was tempted in every point like we are. It doesn't mean he was tempted with every sin that, that might uh, occur in life. But he is aware of every sin. And he's aware of whatever the, the temptations are that we have and how it affects us and how hard it is to resist those temptations. Jesus was tempted a number of times. At the very beginning of his ministry, uh, as far as recorded message is concerned, this is the first time we have you know, recorded about his temptations. In Matthew chapter 4, he's led by the Spirit out into the wilderness. He's there 40 days without eating. And, and Satan comes to him. And the first thing he does is to tempt him with food. If you're the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Now, imagine if you've gone 40 days without eating, and you've got the ability to provide food for you, miraculously provide it there for you. Uh, Would that be a big temptation? If your physical body has been 40 days without eating, in all likelihood, the thing that you would crave most in life is food, something to relieve that hunger. Uh, and so Jesus knows how difficult temptations can be and how hard it is. And because of that, he can be sympathetic toward us, understanding how hard it is for us when we're tempted and why sometimes we give in to those temptations. He never did it, but he knows how difficult it is to resist. And so he can understand that. And yet at the same time, because of that, you know, he's able to show mercy to us. That's why he can be that merciful high priest to us. He understands, and when we sin, even though we sin over and over again, uh, he has that compassion and that mercy uh, that he's willing to forgive. He's willing to provide that for us. So he, he's, he's a merciful high priest, but it, it's, you know, you more that you think about some of the priests, high priests we read about in the New Testament there, people like Annas and Caiaphas, you know, uh, what, what kind of attitude did they have toward those who were involved in sin? What kind of attitude did they have toward Jesus just because they thought he was violating the will of God? What was their attitude toward him? Was it, was it one of mercy uh, to help him? They wanted to kill him, you know. Yeah, they thought he's guilty of sin. You don't deserve but one thing, and that's death. And, and so there's no mercy on their part. And, and so many times that's what the Jews had to put up with and, and, and many of the high priests that they had that were like that. But you and I don't have to worry about that because we've got a high priest who is merciful. But he's not just a merciful high priest. He's a faithful priest. Now, what encouragement does that give to you in having a priest, a high priest, who's faithful? What does that mean? What does it mean to have a faithful priest? Well, let me ask you, what does it mean to have an unfaithful priest? You can't trust him if he's unfaithful. You know, you can't rely upon him to do what he promises to do. You can't rely upon him to do what needs to be done in order for you to be forgiven. Uh, you know, you, you need to have a high priest that's faithful. Faithful, number one, to God. Uh, he, he's going to do what's in keeping with the will of God. God's will was that all men be saved. That's why Jesus was willing to go to that cross and die in order to accomplish the will of God that all men could be saved. So he's faithful to God, but he's also faithful to us. And whenever God promises something, whenever Christ promises something, we can be sure of the fact, we can depend upon him, that that promise is going to be kept. And we know he's faithful to us. And, and as a faithful priest, we can know he's going to do what ne it's necessary in order for us to be forgiven. 
Uh, he's going to do what God has planned for man's salvation. Uh, he's going to be faithful to us to do everything that he can to provide for our salvation. So having someone like this, uh, he's faithful in the sense that he is reliable and dependable, and we can keep our trust and confidence in him. And so we have this faithful and merciful high priest, and, and what he does to us is, uh, the text says, is to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Now, that, that's a word that's found just a few times in the, in the New Testament. Uh, what does it mean to make propitiation for the sins of the people? What, what does the word propitiation mean? It has two basic ideas with it. Well, that, that's going to be involved in it. Uh, he's, he's given himself to die in our place as a substitution. Uh, we're the ones that deserve to be put to death, but he's going to take our place in it. In making a propitiation, two th like there are two things that are really involved in it. Number one, uh, there's the idea of, of the covering of our sin. I'd heard this many times before, but I'd never really checked it out. The word mercy seat. Uh, first of all, what is the mercy seat? The physical mercy seat. Yeah, it's a covering on top of the Ark of the Covenant. It's a covering. And the word there for mercy seat that's used, uh, it's from the same root word that you have here for propitiation. And so just as the mercy seat covered the ark, a propitiation for our sins is the covering of our sin. Our sins need to be covered up. Now, the problem is sometimes we try to cover them ourselves. You know, we, we try to keep that hidden from anybody else. Uh, you, you, know, you find examples of that throughout the Old Testament uh, where people violated God's will and they try to hide it from God and from everybody else. And maybe they're successful at hiding it from men, but it's not hidden from God. Uh, and God knows, and God, uh, you know, will bring that out. And the same thing is still true today. Uh, we might sin, and we might be successful in hiding our sins from people that they'll never know we did it. But God knows. It's not hidden from Him. And if sins are going to be taken care of properly, we need to let God be the one to cover our sins. And, and He does that through the blood of Christ. Christ became the propitiation for our sins. And John 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2, uh, John says that he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Uh, Christ has the ability to cover the sins of every individual who has ever lived or ever will live. But whether or not he covers those sins is whether or not we accept him as our high priest to be the one to take care of that. It covers our sin. But also not just being a covering for our sins, uh, but to make propitiation is also a, a way of appeasing the wrath of God. You know, when we sin, you know, that's, that's when God becomes upset. That's when He's angry with us. When we violate His law, we do things that we're not supposed to do or we fail to do the things we're supposed to do, and so we're guilty of sin, and God's angry with us. If you look in the Old Testament, so many times, where because of Israel's sin as a nation that God becomes angry with them and He thinks about destroying them completely uh, because of their anger. And then man takes action. Think about those times when Moses and Aaron, you know, and uh, God is upset with them and, and plague comes upon them and Moses tells Aaron to take uh, the censer and, and to go burn that incense unto God. You know, and when that's done to appease the wrath of God, you know, then the plague stops. And so Jesus being the propitiation for our sins, when Jesus gave himself to die for us, that was the means of appeasing the wrath of God. So, so that God, you know, anger does not bring about our destruction. And so, you know, there's no need that any individual should ever have to be destroyed eternally in hell because means have been done to appease for the wrath of God and to cover our sins so that when God looks upon us, He looks upon us not as people who are, are sinners, violators of His law, but as people who have been obedient to Him and becoming His children and those who are His children. And so 
He's made it possible for us to, to have that by becoming the propitiation for our sins uh, in that regard. Uh, this translation says to make expiation for the sins of the people. But then in verse 18, he says, For because he himself has suffered and been tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. Uh, and so again, this is getting back to the idea of the type high priest we have. He understands. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, we, we'll do something that we shouldn't have done, and, and, you know, and, and maybe our heart's broken by it. We feel bad because of what we've done. And, and somebody else maybe, you know, you know uh, comes to us, and they're upset uh, because of what we've done. And, and we respond sometimes by saying, you don't understand. You don't understand the situation I was in and, and, and everything. And maybe we're right. Maybe they don't understand. And maybe we don't understand when other people have those problems in their life. But the fact of the matter is that Jesus does understand. And that's so vitally important because he understands he's able to give encouragement and help to us. Uh, even, even in our, our life in situations where we ourselves are involved in sin. Uh, he is able to give aid to those of us when, when we're tempted. He knows so much what it was like. And, and because of that, he can make intercession for us. Now, that's, that's the work of a priest, of making intercession for the people. Uh, and that's exactly what Jesus does as our high priest. He makes intercession for us before God in order that we might uh, not be uh, destroyed, we might not be punished eternally, but that we might be saved. Uh, and brought back unto God. Okay, so... Yeah, and see, that's... That's, again, one of our weaknesses. Sometimes when bad things happen to us, we use that as an excuse not to be faithful. Uh, not to be faithful to our fellow man, our family, or not to be faithful to God. But it didn't matter what happened to Jesus. He was faithful to God and to us. And so, uh, you know, the needs that I have for a high priest to intercede for me is not dependent upon how faithful I am or how good I am, uh, but it's how faithful He is uh, that, that He provides that for us. Now, so far what we've looked at here in chapters 1 and 2, we've talked about mostly about the superiority of Christ. Uh, and that's seen again here in his, his life as our high priest. He is superior. We talked about it linked to, uh, to angels, uh, to that. Now, when you get to chapter 3, He's going to start talking about how superior Christ is to Moses, to Aaron, uh, the Jewish people. And, you know, when you think about that, the Jewish people, when they look back at a man like Moses, I mean, they have great respect for Moses because Moses is the one who provided deliverance for them, bringing them up out of Egypt. Uh, he's the one that gave them the law. He's the one that made intercession for them on numerous occasions. And so they look to Moses with great respect for who he is. And yet, the Hebrew writer here is going to go at length to show us that, that Jesus himself is superior to Moses. And that really is going to go through chapter 4 and about verse 13. Uh, we want to just begin with that tonight, looking at, at the first four verses here uh, of chapter 3 in regard to that. Uh, the writer says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. Uh, so now, as you look at Jesus here and his superiority, two things that are said about him. He is both the apostle of God and the high priest of our confession. Uh, 
And so again, as we look at this an idea of Christ, number one, he, He's the apostle uh, of God to us. Now again, we, we talked about this before. What does the word apostle mean? One cent. Uh, and that, that's the general meaning of that word. And that's why a lot of times you'll have uh, other people in the Bible being called apostles, not in the same sense uh, as, as Jesus or as one of the twelve or, uh, that was selected by Christ, but in the sense that they've been sent by God. But uh, one thing that, that I, I, I thought about this, you know, Christ was on a mission. He had been sent by God. And what mission did God give Jesus? To die for the sinners. Jesus said, that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. Uh, that's what God, that was the mission that God gave him. And so when Jesus left heaven and came to earth, he's on a mission from God. So in that sense, he's an apostle of God, sent on a special mission. But it was interesting to me, uh, Brother Neil Lightfoot, and uh, in his book, uh, he said that the, the word apostle, apostolos, that we have in the Greek, he said it's... Uh, uh, very equivalent to the Hebrew word shaliah, which he says by the end of the first century had meant one sent with authority. Uh, when Christ sent the apostles out, he sent them out with authority. He gave them the authority to do what he was commanding them to do. When Christ was sent by God to come to this earth to seek and to save that which was lost, he was sent with authority to accomplish exactly what God wanted him to accomplish and do what needed to be done. And so an apostle is one that's sent, and he's sent with full authority to represent the one that sent him. The apostles had full authority to represent Christ who sent them, and Christ had full authority to represent his Father who had sent him. And, and that's important because to come and seek and to save that law, those who are lost, uh, without the authority of God to do that, he could never have been successful in it. But, again, not only an apostle, but as we talked about before, a high priest. The priest represents man to God. Uh, he made the sacrifices for man uh, to God in order that men might be brought back unto God in a right relationship with him and that they might be forgiven. Well, Christ came for that very purpose. Yeah, all authority. Yeah, all authority has been given to me, Jesus said. And so he comes with that full authority to do exactly what God wanted him to do. So both in works as an apostle and, and as an intercessor, as a priest, Christ had complete and, and full authority from God to do what God wanted him to do. Uh, and he did that. John chapter 17 and verse 4, Jesus said in, prayer, in his prayer to God, said, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you've given me to do. And so he's accomplished that, that work as an apostle and as a high priest uh, to bring about the salvation of man. Now, Moses himself uh, was a, a type of Christ. Uh, he was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in God's house. And God had promised, uh, back in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, the time was coming. He was going to raise up a prophet like unto Moses. And really, I, as I thought about the similarities between Christ and Moses and how Moses could be a type of Christ, I generally came up with, I think it was three or four similarities between the two uh, that show that. Uh, Brother Burton Kaufman, in his commentary, uh, gave a list, and I, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And he said these are, are by no means not all. And, and, but I thought it was interesting. I just I, I put these down. I want to notice it. We talk about Moses now as a type of Christ, the similarities between these two. Number one, both became sons of virgin princesses. Now, when I first read that, that kind of blew my mind. I thought, what does he mean? Now, I know about Christ. He was born of a virgin. Uh, Mary had never known man. Uh, she had never had sexual relations with anyone, and yet she becomes pregnant, and that's through the Holy Spirit. So I can understand about, you know, uh, Jesus coming uh, uh, as a born of a virgin. But how in the world could you say that about Moses? 
Well, who was Moses' adopted mother? The princess of Egypt, the daughter of Pharaoh. And as such, she would have been one who would not uh, have been allowed to have sexual relations with someone before she's married. So she's never uh, known a man. And yet she becomes the mother of Moses, an adopted mother, but becomes his mother to raise him from the time that he's a child, to raise him up. So I just thought that was interesting, you know, that they bring this out, that type of similarity. Uh, number two, both were Israelites. That is, both Moses and Jesus were Israelites. God had specified when he, when he had foretold about this prophet to come that's to be like Moses, that he said he's to be from among your brethren. And so the one that's going to be like Moses is, is not going to be a Gentile. It's going to be a, a Hebrew. And so both Jesus and Moses were Israelites. They, they were born uh, of Jewish parents. Uh, number three, both were sent to the children of Israel. Moses was sent uh, by God uh, back to Egypt, you know, to his people Israel. He goes back there for a specific person, purpose to a specific people. And same thing with Jesus. When Jesus came, who did he come to? He came to the children of Israel. He came to save the lost. That was the purpose for his coming. But who he came to is he came to the Jews. Uh, he, he was born of Jews. And so he came to them. And initially, that's where his work is. And when he sends his disciples out on what we sometimes call the limited commission, where did he tell them to go? Only to the house of Israel. Only to the Jewish people that, that they're going. And so Moses goes to, to the Jewish people there in bondage. Uh, both forsook the high status of their lives to perform a mission of rescue. Now, Moses originally, now remember now, he's grown up in, in the household of Pharaoh. Uh, so he's in a position uh, where he is a, a person of authority, a person of great wealth, uh, education. I mean, just at that time, you couldn't have had a better physical life provided for you than what's given to him there in, in Pharaoh's household. Uh, but he gave that up, choosing to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He's willing to give that up to do what? To rescue God's people. He sees a, a Israelite being beaten by an Egyptian, and he interposed himself there and killed the Egyptian. Uh, and, and later he has to flee. But even there over the land of Midian, God sends him back to Israel to rescue those people. Uh, so he's left that high position that he had and, and comes to rescue these people. But Jesus did the same thing. Uh, Jesus was in heaven. I mean, he, he sat there in the splendors of the paradise of God, dwelled with him there throughout all eternity to that point, and yet he's willing to give that up and come down to this earth, being born into poverty uh, in order to come on a rescue mission. Uh, to save men from their sins. Number five, both were rejected. When, when Moses, you know, has <clears throat> sees a, a, another time there, he sees a Jew fighting or arguing with another Jew, and, and he comes in and he tries to stop that, you know, and, and the reaction on him was, who made you to be a judge between us or over us? You know, they, they didn't accept him as being the one who would be their ruler or their guide. And so they rejected him. In John chapter 1, when Jesus was born, uh, the Bible says he came into his own, meaning his own people, and his own people received him not. They rejected him. Uh, though there were some Jews who believed in him and who would follow him and who would die for him, the great majority of them, especially of the religious leaders among us, rejected him. And still to this day, uh, he, he is rejected for the most part uh, by the Jewish people. Six, both accomplished their mission. Moses was sent to deliver the Israelites from Egyptian bondage, and he did that. He was able to get them out of Egypt and get them over where they were able to enter that land that God had promised them. Jesus had accomplished his mission. He made it possible for men to be saved 
He died on the cross, and by his death, it became possible for men to be forgiven of their sins. He became the covering, the propitiation of sins and the means of appeasing the wrath of God against us for the sins we've committed. Both did many miracles. Now, this is one that I'd always thought about. I, you know, this is one I came up with in my own mind. Uh, you know, Moses does those miracles. There, there are certain miracles that he gave uh, to impress upon the Israelite people that he is sent from God. Then the ten plagues that are brought upon the uh, nation of Egypt uh, is evidence that he is from God. Uh, and so numerous miracles. And, and the Bible said that this prophet uh, that God's going to raise up to be like unto Moses, it, that's one of the things he does. does many miracles. And when you come to the New Testament, uh, over and over again you see the great works that Christ did among the people. Now the first miracle of both had a startling resemblance. Uh, one of the first things that, that, that Moses did, uh, you get into uh, the ten plagues, what did he do? Turned the water to blood. Took that staff, struck the Nile River, and it became blood, and all the drinking fountains and all they had became blood. What was the first miracle that Jesus did? Water to wine. Moses changed water to blood. Jesus changed water to wine. Now, there, there's a similarity in that because that wine represents, the day represents the blood of Christ to us, and it, sometimes it's used in that way in the New Testament. And so there's the similarities between the initial miracles that they did. Uh, there was something in common in the inauguration of the law of Moses and that of Christ. Now, this is something I never thought about and never would have thought about. I don't believe it. I'd ever come up with this. Uh, but in, in uh, Moses' law, when, when that was first uh, inaugurated, when it began, uh, Exodus chapter 32, verse 38. If you'll turn over there to that for just a moment. Exodus 32 and verse 38. Now, it hadn't been that many days ago that in trying to read through the Bible again this year that I'd covered through Exodus. Who's got chapter 32 and verse 38 can read that for us? It's not 38. Well, maybe I've got the wrong first. I don't know why I said 38. Uh, Exodus 32, let me see here. When I looked that up earlier, make sure it's not earlier than that. Well, it's in record. It's in respect to this. Maybe it's recorded in another place, and I got the wrong one down out of the book. But what happened is, in doing this, when the people had rejected it, three thousand of the Jews were killed uh, of the plague that God brought in because of their not listening to God. Well, I know of several times I had read that about that happening. Three thousand of them being killed. But is it verse 28 and not 38? Okay. Uh, verse 28. Uh, Darnell, would you go ahead and read that if you've got that? Okay. So in the beginning here, when, when, when the, the law is being presented to them, they begin that, 3,000 of them uh, that have disobeyed are put to death. The inauguration of Christ's law in Acts chapter 2 on, on the day of Pentecost when Peter stood up with the other apostles and they, they preached the gospel to the people. What was the response of the people? 3,000 souls were obedient and, and so were saved. And so, you know, I, I'd never made any connection between those two. 3,000 died uh, when the law given by Moses, uh, was first begun. And when Christ's New Testament law begins with his, his requirements for salvation, 3,000 people are saved. Uh, both were transfigured. Now, we know about Christ. You know, uh, we're, we're familiar with that Matthew 17. 
uh, he takes his three closest friends with him up on the mountain, and there he's transfigured before them. What happened to him when he's transfigured? Yeah, he, he becomes to glow, you know, uh, brilliance greater than, 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 the, than the sun uh, as he's changed before them. And his garments become uh, like that in, in, in his face. Well, what happened to Moses when he came down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments? And, and the people noticed what? His face was shiny. And he didn't know it. Uh, but the people did. They, they noticed that appearance about him. Uh, and again, that's found in, uh, in Exodus chapter uh, 34, verses 29 and 30, uh, when, uh, when Moses comes down, and that's very close to where we were at. But in chapter 34, uh, verse 29, beginning, When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of the testimony in his hand, he came down from the mountain. Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. And when Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Uh, so a transfiguration of sorts, like that of Christ uh, that, that he had. Uh, number 11, both delivered God's law to the people. Now this is the other one that I understood very quickly and got uh, God gave his law to Israel through Moses. Uh, the first five books are referred to as the Torah, the law. Uh, and, and that was given to the Israelite people through Moses. Uh, but then the new law is given to us through Christ. Uh, he came, and, and later on here in the book of Hebrews, we're going to be looking about how that he became the mediator of a better law, a superior law to that law that they had. Uh, but both delivered God's law to people. Both offered themselves to die for Israel. Now, the occasion with Moses uh, is Exodus 32. Again, back to, to chapter 32. And look at verse, uh, verse 32. Someone read that for us. Exodus 32, 32. Who's got that for us? Moses was willing to die, you know, you know, pleading with God to forgive the people of their sin. But if not, he said, blot me out, you know, uh, offering himself up, uh, not just to die physically, but to be blotted out of God's book of life. And, and we do know that in the New Testament, of course, Jesus had offered the same thing. Uh, John chapter 10 and verse 17 uh, Jesus said that yet God had given him that power to lay down his life. He said, no man takes it from me. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up. And see, he offers to lay down his own life. And in the instance of Christ, he does so. He gives up his life in order that, uh, that men might be redeemed. Number 13, both made a marriage with the Gentiles. Moses married a Gentile woman. And that was one of the things, you know, that... Uh, uh, his sister and brother were upset with him about doing that. Uh, that's in Numbers chapter 12 and verse 1. <clears throat> now, Jesus never married. Well, Jesus is married. Who's, who's his bride? The church. And the church is made up of who? Of people. Two groups of people. Jews and Gentiles. <laughs> we're Gentiles, and yet we're part of the bride of Christ. And so... Moses had marriage with a, with a Gentile woman. Christ, part of his, his bride, is a Gentile. Moses lifted up the serpent. Jesus lifted up himself upon the cross. This is the other thing that I could think about. Uh, these are two things very familiar with us. But when the <clears throat> Israelites had sinned against God and he sent fiery serpents in among them, uh, and, and when the people were bitten by those serpents, they were put to death, and Moses cries out to God on behalf of the people. And God told Moses, you know, you build a serpent out of brass or a pole and put it up. And then when anybody's bitten it, they'll look at that, they'll be healed. And so Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness to provide healing for the people who were bitten by snakes. But Jesus lifted up himself on the cross. Uh, and so he, he talks about that. Again, this in the, in the book of, uh, let me lift that up. 
uh, John chapter 3 and verse 14. And I, if I be lifted up, Jesus said, will draw all men to myself. Number 15, both gave bread to the people. Uh, Moses gave them manna when they complained about not having anything to eat. Uh, Jesus, a uh, couple of ways, physically he took, you know, the, the two loaves and five small fish or whatever and, and, and multiplied it to feed the people. But Jesus himself is that bread come down from heaven to give life to the people. <clears throat> so both were subjects uh, of interposition on the part of God when they died. Uh, you look, first of all, uh, Moses was buried by God, Deuteronomy 34 and verse 6. So God intervened there to bury Moses. Uh, you know, Satan desired to have the body of Moses, uh, but he was rebuked there, and, and God buried Moses. And God's the only one that knows where, where Moses was buried. But when Jesus died, God interposed again himself, not to bury, but to resurrect. And he raised up his son Jesus from the dead. And so, you know, over and over again, you see the similarities that exist between Moses and Jesus. And why Moses then becomes, as it were, a type of Christ. Now, there are a lot of similarities, but there are also some, some areas dissimilarity between them that we could talk about probably the same number uh, as that but uh, our time's gone for tonight next week what I want to do is is to go back to the very beginning of this when he made the statement about that uh, to look again at how Moses was also a type of an apostle and a type of a high priest just as Jesus is and how they too could be how Moses could be a type of Christ uh, Let's uh, close out with a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father, we're so grateful and thankful to Thee for Your Son that You've given to be that uh, means by which we could be forgiven of our sins and be restored to Thee. And we pray, Father, that as we continue this study through the book of Hebrews that we will be impressed once more with the great superiority of Christ to all others, as superior to angels, but also superior to Moses, the great lawgiver, and Aaron, the great high priest. And help us, Father, to be appreciative of what has been done for us when you gave your Son and he gave his life for us. Dismiss us now, please, in your care. Keep us safe and allow us to be back again, Father, the next week to continue this study. In Jesus' name, amen.